two, one. We are back, people, for the third episode of You Are Not Your Roaz. Can you believe it? Max hasn't killed me yet. I am Raba, your host, joined alongside my co-host, co-founder, Max Blank, and overall e-commerce crusher. And then we have Jason, the international man of mystery, the eyelash kingpin, Jason Wong, everybody. Hello, hello. Hello, So I am out in Austin, Texas, in our satellite campus. Max is crushing it in the Midwest at our HQ in Columbus. Where does this podcast find you today, Jason? I am in New York for the week. Oh, that's awesome. You're originally, or you were out of uh, California, right? Orange County? You're over there with uh, Chase. Yeah, I'm right next to Chase, um, like five minutes away. I I usually live in Orange County, but I'm here for the week. I'm working on Shopify for now. Um, Just been fun seeing some friends. it's been raining a lot here, though, so I don't I don't like the rain. Definitely missed the sun in California. <laughs> Look at that. Living up to your uh, international man of mystery, coast to coast. I like it. So I did a little stalking on you. Um, are you from Hong Kong or you were born in Hong Kong? Yep, I was born in Hong Kong, 1997, uh, a month before the British handed over. So I'm technically a British citizen. Um, and then I moved to America. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh. I moved to America when I was eight. Yeah, <laughs> a little fun fact. <laughs> That's awesome. And then, so do you hold a British passport as well as an American? Yeah, I have uh, both passports. I'm also a um, Canadian um, resident and then um, Hong Kong resident, so four countries. You see the international man, yeah. I'm telling <laughs> you, you right, this guy yeah. is just absolutely living up to it. Okay, so tell us a little bit about kind of, I know we have dough that I really want to get into, but you also did something called Wong House, right? Yeah, so I started Wong House about five years ago as a way to become like my sandbox. Um, I'm very restless, my mom likes to say that. Uh, So I like to do a billion things at once. I cannot focus on building one single company. So Wong House was like Mm. my my playground for me to bring up all these ideas, things I want to do without creating like a billion LLCs. And if you've ever started an LLC, you know the process of doing so is tedious. So I'm like, okay, let me just create one single company where I can be creative, I can work on a bunch of projects at once and, and that's really the premise of one house over time it kind of evolved over into a brand incubator if you will where we develop brands our own but we also start investing and scaling other people's brands so that's kind of where we're at right now that's awesome what's been the most fun project you've worked on so far there um beyond dough i would say like i love working with um, an alcohol brand i'm involved with called nectar uh, seeing the growth of uh, yeah. alcohol brand has been very, very tremendously uh, rewarding, but also just a lot of challenges that you will get when running an alcohol brand, you typically won't see with a consumer brand. So that, that's been mm-hmm. very fun. Um, seeing people consume something that you're a part of has been very, very fulfilling. Um, beyond that, just been, I love teaching. So teaching is one of the part of the components of Wall House. So I have my own class. I also teach at Shopify. So being able to teach and help people has been also really rewarding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you you dropped that big, uh, awesome course. That website's beautiful. We'll link it uh, in the show notes. What What is it called again? Building Blocks. Building Blocks. That's right. Uh, it's go- the website's gorgeous mm-hmm. alone with the price of admission. Um, Jason, don't you also do some um, <clears throat> help with sourcing through Wong House as yeah. well? Yeah. Uh, one of our companies is a sourcing and logistics company, which is not really in a good time right now because everything's so expensive. Right. That That is something that we are that we have a company for. Do you, do you see any potential challenge? I mean, I think there are, but from your perspective, I think it'd be really helpful. Any challenges coming up right now for this Black Friday, what people can expect? Is it going to be a bit more expensive this Black Friday for your holiday presents? Yeah, um, everything obviously is increasing in price, raw material prices, shipping prices. Uh, merchants, if you're not increasing your pricing, you're going to see a lower margin, very obviously, especially with Facebook attacking you on one front and you have supply chain attacking you on the other front. That's getting more challenging. So I'm not going to say it's glamorous. Um, what we're going to see is that there might be some supply shock. Um, inventories are going to get more difficult to get. Things so will get a little more expensive. And at the end of the day, consumer eats all of that, right? The, the victim is yeah. always going to be the consumer. So um, I think that's just some of the the trend that we've been seeing over the past few months that will translate into the next few months. Unfortunately, not really a light at the end of the tunnel yet. Right. Are you seeing a lot of brands diversify their supply chains at all geographically? Somewhat. It's it's also limitations on like, can you actually get it 
outsource to your domestic vendors over overseas. For example, electronics, it's very difficult for you to have an electronics manufacturer in the United States. Right. So even if you don't want to do it in China, you have no other choice but to do it in China. Now, fabric and textile, you can go to Pakistan, Turkey, and all that stuff. So you could move out of China for a little bit, but they're all going to be on the same ship crossing the Atlantic Ocean. What about Mexico? That's though? where the problem is. Yeah, Mexico is great. Um, I think for apparel, um, at least like print on demand items, Mexico is great. But Mexico is one of those things where you you have to have that volume for it to make sense. Got it. Um, because typically for vendors that are close by, um, they're they're generally working with larger larger buyers than someone who's buying like 50, 100 pieces. I got it. Okay, it's good insight. So I feel like there's not so much conversation in the DDC world about supply chain as much as there is about marketing. So that's a cool little snippet. Maybe something we could talk about another time, you know, get more into it. Yeah, agreed, Max. There's another boring subject, returns, um, <laughs> but it's also a huge part of the business. And you can do a lot. Amazon's doing some cool stuff with it now. Um, but wow, Jason, I didn't know you're just a man of all talents as well as a, a, a worldly. Um, so you're obviously definitely the youngest guy on this podcast. You're in a uber successful place like how did you uh, from my notes you started hustling at 14 how, how did you build up all this like motivation knowledge um in that the we'll link to the shopify plus or the shopify masters podcast but the way you think about marketing the way you think about life like how do you kind of stay the course what's your north star do you have any frameworks or how do you stay so productive and so happy um, I mean, in the beginning, it was a means of survival. Um, I wasn't good at school. I was absolutely horrible at school. Um, and it was so bad that I actually didn't get accepted into most colleges I applied to. And so it was mm. more so for like, okay, if, I don't, if I'm not going to be in school, I need to be really good at something else because I need to get out of here. Um, so my initial motivation was survival. I need to make money. And then my motivation started turning into, okay, I want fulfillment. Well, what does fulfillment mean for me? Fulfillment means spending quality time with friends and family, being able to build meaningful relationships, being able to enjoy the finer things in life. And the motivation to accomplish all that is entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I'm able to have the freedom to you know, leave for a week to New York to see some friends. I can go see my parents and do whatever. And so the motivation became less so on the extrinsic value of how much money I can make, but more so on how much time can I buy by doing what I do. Um, and at the end of the day, it's really money or time that you're trading off in this world, right? You, you spend time to make money, you get money to get some time back. And so over time, it's been finding the balance, finding happiness and finding uh, my passion. And my passion is just creating things. I love making things that people can use and see and appreciate. And so over time, the end goal and the motivation has really evolved. It's great. Love that's it. beautiful, man. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> Jeez, I need to, I'm all amped up already. So it was like a mini TED Talk right there, Jason. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Um, so what's the nicest thing somebody's ever done for you? Oh, <laughs> there's a ton. I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of loving people. Um, I think whenever people check in on me, um, when we haven't really talked, that's really nice. I appreciate these things a lot. I think like us entrepreneurs, you guys will most likely experience this, is that we're so in the weeds of our business. We're so in the trenches that sometimes it's very easy to forget that we have mm -hmm. people we need to talk to, right? So being able to get that message saying, hey, Jason, how are you doing? Checking in on you. It's, some, it's the little nice things that people do that you really end up appreciating and it makes you want to be like, okay, I want to be also very much present for the other people. I need to work harder so I can do that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Last question of the main segment. What's one skill or talent that is really random that somebody wouldn't guess you have? And it doesn't necessarily need to be productive, more like a quirky um, kind of like, what? He can beat some video game in under five seconds or something like that. <laughs> Um, I'm a sushi chef and a DJ. No way. Wow. What kind of, what kind of music? Um, I do a lot of house, some trap, love to mix yeah. hip, uh, hip hop. Uh, um, I actually took that, took up that skill during quarantine because I realized I really, I just really liked to entertain people. And if, when you're in the music, uh, when you're sorry, when you're in the party, 
controlling the music pretty much controls the vibes of the party, right? So I learned how to DJ. And yeah. then uh, back then, a few years ago, when I was trying to make some side money, I took up a sushi chef job. So I became a sushi chef. I can make all kinds of sushi if you ever need me to do that. So, um, yeah, two, two quirks. Okay, so the Triple Whale Conference, we're putting you on the spot. You'll DJ it and cater yep, it. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. We, he's in, Max. He's in. There you go. Rabba, what right. about you? <laughs> what about you, Rabba? Um, weird talents. Oh man, I'm such an odd bug. Um, I won freshman of the year, um, in my conference for cross country run in division one. Wow. I'm a big fatty now, but I used to be really, okay. really fast. Yeah. Damn. No, that's my one weird quirk. All right. Now, well, if we both went max, you can't just let us hang. What, what's yours? <laughs> I've uh, been a drummer for over 20 years. We can make a band. Let's go. Yes. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> So All right, so that wraps up the main segment, folks. Now this is what you've been waiting in line for. Now you get to, I hate I'm going to use this phrase, but pick Jason's brain. All right, Jason, the way you think about building a business I thought was so fascinating. The, the way you kind of have that sec, first, secondary, and tertiary stages, can you kind of walk the people through how you think that who aren't familiar with that, that process that you have? Because I think that is just spot-on fascinating. Yeah, so whenever I think about building a business, it's always about building up the MVP. Every single person always starts with the MVP. Um, for me, it was thinking about, well, what is that product that I'm making that is unique in the space and, and like the really the UVP of it? There's no point in to getting to a business if you're not making any substantial differences. Otherwise, you're just copying something else, right? So my first stage is to figure out what is the least amount of effort and money I need to put into um, making this product to make it viable. Um, you know, time and money is very costly, so you don't want to put too much time and money into the stage. Um, once you test it out, it's time for the second stage, and that is to essentially build out the foundations of your business. Can you build out who your audience is? Can you look into how do you market this product, the copy, the angles, um, really building out like the visuals of the brand to, in order to market to the customers. And then the third stage for me is scaling. But scaling isn't just about running Facebook ads and letting it rip. Scaling is getting your brand to be recognized um, by your by customers beyond just the visuals of it. So whenever you think about the brands that people respect, like the Teslas, the Allo Yoga, the Lululemon, um, you know all these things, you think about what is that one thing that you talk to your friends about when you're introducing them about this product. So for example, AirPods. Um, AirPod isn't just a, a, pair, a piece of headphone. Whenever you talk to your friends about buying a pair of AirPods, you're telling them, yeah, it does noise canceling, it fits in your pocket perfectly, yada, yada, yada. These are the things that are just not just visuals of a brand, but is the feeling and the experience that you get from using a product that you want to talk to your friends about. So the biggest challenge for any DDC brand is how do we emulate that idea and that concept for our product? What can we do for our product and within our marketing message that will make our customers become our biggest advocators? And that's really like the, the three steps of building a brand for me at like a conceptual level. Of course, there's going to be a lot of small details and tactics that you do, but happy to jump into those too. It's great. Man, I need a cigarette after that, Jason. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, wow. So in terms of, I know kind of a little side digression here. With Doe, you kind of inverted that a little bit, though, because you stumbled upon what you found was kind of what we call a, a blue ocean market, right, where there was just no no incumbent. There was just all this market share up for grabs. There was money in that segment of the market, but there really wasn't any big competitors. And then from that, you basically went straight Sherlock Holmes. And <laughs> from what I've heard, read pretty much every Reddit post ever <laughs> on fake eyelashes and then derived <laughs> kind of the value drivers for customers. And then you went to sourcing. So that, that's just so cool to hear you blade it out there and then think of how you implemented it for just one of the, the we're talking about doe eyelashes. If anybody doesn't know, uh, it's one of the DTC darlings. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll let them plug it later in the show. Um, so the next question I have for you kind of speaking about doe, what are a few things that you, uh, there's, there's a multiple two of reason. I can't say just one because that that's not too strong. Right. So I'll list them out for you. Number one is I think we did a very good job at intentionally designing our brand 
when we think about our brand yeah. as a tone, as a personality, as the mission behind it, right? Like when people look at Doe, it's not just a pretty brand. It's that we're a lifestyle brand. We stand for something. We have a very particular style that when you wear our products, you feel our products. Um, that's something that's you can't really just run Facebook ads and get to, right? So it's very well designed to create this experience that our customers can fit into. I would say number two is our our heavy focus in influencer and and brand marketing. Um, we picked the right people to represent our brand. We picked the right messaging, and we were very careful in crafting the message with them in order to get to their audience. We weren't just sending out PR boxes and hopefully someone takes a picture on the Instagram story. No, we're working very, very closely with every single person that pushes us to make sure that we're crafting the right messaging to their audience. I would say number three is our efficiency and operation. That's one of the things that no one will ever talk about. but operations for any type of business is super important so one of the things that we did was automating any part of the processes that we can automate we brought down influencer marketing outreach from 30 minutes to 30 seconds we built the entire back end to handle a gifting process that's virtually seamless and automatic which means that we can actually run influencer marketing faster mm -hmm. and more efficient than virtually any other brand on the market at no cost um, we were also very much good at focusing on product. There's no point in building a brand with a product that people only buy once because the money is always in the second and third buy. So how do you do that? Well, making a really good product is one first and foremost most important. If you just create a really bad product and hope that your marketing can save you, well, it won't because you'll get bleed out by the CDC space. So making a product that people can actually love actually real and for being very authentic in our marketing has been the key to driving people to come back again and again but also the post purchase experience that we give to our customers making them our second and third time purchasers um, has been key because instead of spending money on facebook and burning it because they're not coming back again we only have to acquire this person once and they're gonna come back second third fourth time because the product is good and we have a very well designed post purchase experience solid yeah Speaking of that post-purchase experience, you did some really cool stuff with kind of shipment timing and reviews, if I recall, right? Or just shipment timing in general. You were, I remember a thread on something where you're using kind of, I forget the, the mix of it, but there was some app that you had that then you knew when the right when the thing was delivered. Yeah, so I, I think that was for was. requesting yeah. reviews. Have you ever That's bought something online? Um, some, after some time, you place an order, they're going to be like, hey, would you like to take the, leave a review for the right. box of chocolate you just bought? Um, but what if you haven't gotten that product yet? Like some people get emails um, <laughs> to get a review when they have never That's even gotten a product right yet. There. So we're like, that doesn't make sense because <laughs> right? Pe people hate that. They don't like that. So we use this app called Wonderman, which allows us to track every single order that we ship out as well as um, events for those the, the progress of the packaging. Um, so that we are able to trigger events based on the shipment status rather than on the order place. Most people do a trigger on, oh, seven days right. later after they place an order, we'll send them an email. But what if the product takes, uh, what if the product takes like ten, nine yep. days or 11 days, then that's wrong, right? So we made, made our trigger to be like, we're going to send out this email three days after the product has been delivered. And then they're going to get the email to say, hey, would you like to leave a review? So it's only after the product has been delivered that so they get the That's review. great. I have two random questions, okay? Number one, in, in, mm -hmm. in the realm of retention marketing, have you tried <clears throat> direct? Yeah, we have done postcards. We have done postcards um, automatically for abandoned carts. We've seen like mixed, -ish, uh, mixed response there. I, I wouldn't rule it out yet, but I think direct now still has this mm -hmm. place for DDC. Probably a little bit, if our audience was a little bit older, we're going to see a lot more bite. But we did like abandonment cart postcards where if they left something in their cart, was we'll How long did it take you get? 50% off. How long did like, it take you get? It worked for a bit. Um, five, six days after abandoned cart, we trigger immediately. But it's also dependent on the post system, right? So that I would say that's a caveat for it. For abandoned cart, you that's typically want quick. to get yeah. there like within three days. Yeah, so that that's kind of like the only caveat we've had with that. It's just, right. It's very I would think a campaign this. would would really work well with it, given that, like you said, right, a post a banner card you mm -hmm. want immediately. So I'm curious about a campaign how that would do. Mm -hmm. um, second question: How much thought did you give Doe 
Um, how much thought did you put into dough when designing the packages to optimize for um, costs on delivery, right? I feel like that's not talked about. I, I did that for one of my brands and I was yeah, able to um, bring it down half my, my postage costs. I'm wondering, since you have a... Yeah, I mean, our cost has thankfully been very, very low, but we're constantly optimizing it to be better. Um, but at the same time, we're very right. much intentional with our packaging, not on just the cost, experience. but on the, okay. the the green effects it oh. has, right? Like experience, but also the green effect. Like we're using recycled paper. We have to use the proper uh, material. We're changing our plastic intrates, uh, like the plastic insert trays into paper insert trays. So these are the factors that we're considering on top of how marketable the pro uh, the packaging is, but also how cheap it is to ship it. So there, there's a multitude of factors affecting our final decisions on how we make the packaging. Oh, I love that, man. Uh-huh. It's cool. It's very cool. And do, do you, do you um, outsource some of that stuff? I mean, like, to be able to, I guess you have Wallhouse, yeah. so it's not like you have to outsource it. You already have that, that, uh, those lines. But, you know, you don't hear much about the design and creation mm -hmm. of packaging. Yeah, it's all in-house Packaging, we, right? In, in the space. Yeah. So, we, we I guess don't know how to do it. That's how we maintain our back. quality. Uh, and Max, to kind of circle back on your postcard question, it's a great uh, question. We actually, for a client, um, have a, uh, a product, and then there was some product that was actually messed up in terms of the packaging. Um, and so we, what we did, because we needed to fire sell this product so we could offer it at 50% off, what we did was send postcards to all mm -hmm. the people that had bought the product and bought the product once but haven't purchased okay. in six months. I'm like, hey, here's a... And, to Jason's point, it it was it, it was at best in a creative channel. Like it's okay. you're not going to run your business off of uh, paper snail mail. But I would definitely suggest, especially with the intricacies of Clavio now, you can do some really interesting things. There's something called Postpilot that essentially just links into um, and it'll do that the the whale okay. or snail whale mail sign up people um, uh, the <laughs> snail <laughs> mail for you, but. Um, Okay, cool. I have a couple more for you, Jason, and then we'll get into the rapid fire. So I'll let you get your, your mind right. But um, right now, what do you think we're in just kind of this really almost a new epoch, if you will, of media buying, marketing, what have you. What do you think the most important skills as a brand operator are yeah. now? Um, creatives. Um I think as we see a lot more people competing in the ad space, more and more people would need to stand out with the right creative and things that essentially become stump stopping um, creatives. I, I think a lot of brands today have to be unique and stand out in order to really compete in the ad space. Yeah, I love that. Okay, one quick one more for you. If you were to start a brand now and I gave you a million dollars, how would you allocate it? I would spend half into marketing, um, a quarter of that into hiring really good talent. Um, the rest are going to be in um, inventory and a little bit on the miscellaneous cost. Those are like the three biggest components that you really need to start a brand. And for people who aren't watching, he's doing all this math in his head, people. Right. He's doing all the math in the head. All right, Jason, you've made it to the rapid fire segment, my man. I love you, but I don't know how Max feels about you, so he's going to take you to the ring of um, rapid fire. Max, take it away. Okay. Uh, Miami, overrated or underrated? Ooh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hot take. Um, Real quick. I, I, I think there's a good space for it. Yeah, it's underrated. <laughs> Okay, BFCM, overrated or underrated? Oh, overrated. Hmm. Well, I'd like to hear more about that at some point. Okay, loyalty programs, overrated or underrated? Underrated. Yeah, Ooh, I'm, can I'm, you, I'm with can you. Can you double click on that? <laughs> oh, you want me to elaborate on that? Yeah, just a, just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, not a lot of brands do uh, loyalty programs properly, and they, even if they have a loyalty program, they don't utilize it fully. Uh, what we are doing right now is we're treating loyalty program as a special membership program where we give exclusivity, uh, we do early access sales, we give uh, free airdrops into points into their accounts to stimulate purchases. Most companies don't do any of those three things I just mentioned. Right. So like being able to fully utilize this loyalty program 
um, I, I think that it's underrated that it's underused, but it's also like people who are using it are not really using it to its full potential. Yeah, sure. Love that. It's beyond the punch cards, you know, like those physical punch cards. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, branding, overrated or underrated? Underrated. Instagram, over or under? Over. But you have a okay, huge well, following on there. You have an awesome Instagram. We do. You, that, you personally, though, that, too, that, have an awesome Instagram. It, yeah, that's what makes it overrated, though. Like, I feel like we're putting too much of our eggs into one basket. Like, when Instagram goes down, we're all doomed. Okay. And that's why I think it's overrated. Diversify. Otherwise, I still love using it. It's more like diversify, yeah, you right? Have, you, all, you, all, you all gotta do that. Yeah. Okay, what's your favorite car? Car? Mm-hmm. Uh, McLaren 765 LT. Okay. What do those go um, for? Like half a million around there. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> a little bit less. Yeah, it's half your I budget right there, man. It's half your DVC budget. <laughs> <That's> the... <laughs> <laughs> Car or brand? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what brand? And I said car or new brand. What do you know? <laughs> Uh, man, you gotta make your you gotta make your assets worth That's your right. liabilities. That's right. Okay. Uh, favorite meal and why? Oh, I love hot pots. Uh, hot pot is like a it's like an Asian cuisine where you have a pot and everyone just sits around the table and they just cook inside a pot. I just think it's like the best bonding experience, but also food is so good. Wow. Um, what's the best DDC conference? Ooh, uh, love geek out for yeah. sure. Um, Ecom World is great, but that's virtual. Um, I would say those two are like the only two I've gone to. I don't really go to any mm -hmm. other ones. Um, nothing bad to them. It's just after a while, they, they kind of get repetitive. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite place to travel to and why? Yeah, I really love Japan. I went to Tokyo, Japan, climb Mount oh, Fuji. Cool. Um, the, the air is beautiful. Um, people are incredibly nice. It's so colorful. Um, so yeah, Japan is the top one for me. Favorite way to spend your time? Mm, I love traveling, uh, even though that's technically not really like a chill thing. I just love to see sure. new places, new people, getting out of my bubble. I, that's where I get creative. Right. Uh, favorite follow on Twitter? Ooh, yep. like someone that I follow? Um, I love Farouk. Um, have you ever seen Farouk? He's a... He's a guy of many talents, and I just love watching how he thinks. Um, everyone just, even myself included, we just tweet like marketing or like e-com or whatever, but Fruix all over a place, which I love. I, hmm. I just love like being introduced to new concepts by him. I'll have to check it out, yeah. What's um, the handle? Uh, F A R O. Yes, I think I do follow. Perfect. For, yeah, interesting. Okay, guy. so here's the, here's the final one. <clears throat> If you could have dinner with any three people, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Uh, love to get dinner with Toby from Shopify. Love to get dinner with Jack Ma yeah. from Alibaba. Just love the way that he thinks. Um, and I would say probably get lunch with my dad. <laughs> He's still alive, don't worry. But I um, haven't seen him in a while. So All love right. to get that with him. Very nice. That's wonderful. Wow. You made it through, Jason. Rapid fire. You look unscathed, unfazed, just stoic as ever, man. Awesome. Well, this is kind of the closing of the show. Did you want to plug anything, Jason? Or are you? I know you're doing just tons of cool stuff. Doe is amazing. Take it away. Um, download Triple Well if you need really good Thanks. analytics platform for you. Jason is our first believer. Our what first believer that? right here, Jason. Oh, man. This has been great. Our first retweet. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Jason, Powerful retweet. Yeah, I'll that for you guys. I know we had to grease some palms with, with your assistant to get you on the show, uh, but thank you again for making time for us. Um, if you guys want to get more involved in Triple Whale, go to trytriplewhale.com. We're also on the Twitter is at trytriplewhale. Jason's on the Twitter is at eggroll. And then I think that's it, guys. We made it through another one. Thanks so much for yep. your time, and uh, we'll see everybody on the flip. Thanks, Jason. See you guys. Of course. Yeah. That's awesome, guys. That's fun.